So Fitbit has a monolith. And I think that most of you can probably guess how we got here. About nine years ago, our CEO made the first commit, and we've been building on it ever since. And at every step, that kind of was a pragmatic decision, right? Because we had all of our operational stuff figured out. We had all the deploy, all of the metrics, all of the alerting. It was all there. And for each incremental change that we made, it didn't really make sense to reinvent that from scratch. So we kept building and building. And so now we have this million lines of code that just kind of sits there. And we want to fix this. We want to make this better. And I joined about a year ago to help with that effort. And the project that I was working on was sort of one of the initial steps that you take when you're breaking apart a monolith, which is writing a front-end server. And uh, I use the term front-end server because in tiered service sort of deployments, uh, anything which is upstream of you, which calls into you, is a front-end, and anything that you call into is a back-end. And of course, that's relative. You are a back-end to your front-end. But in the sort of entire system, there is one server which is the front-endiest, right? And that is the front-end server. And you've also heard this called the gateway server, maybe some other things, but I like front-end. So the front-end server exists so that when we start to cordon off pieces of code and we start to uh, kind of pull them out into their own little piece, we can route traffic to it, right? Um, this allows us to start to kind of think about these things a little bit more modularly. And the role of our server is to route the traffic, right? Make sure that it goes to the right place, uh, the right service is receiving requests. Uh, it's to validate traffic, make sure that the, traffic, that the requests are well formed. And this can mean that you know, they conform to the HTTP spec, but also that they are authenticated, that they aren't uh, kind of pathological in some way. Uh, it also will shape or prioritize traffic, right? If our back end is sort of under load, is not able to handle all the requests, uh, it's our job to decide uh, which requests go overboard first. And so the way to think about the server, which is a very small focused piece of code, uh, is that it's fulcrum, right? It is positioned very advantageously with respect to the rest of our code in a way that can sort of effect great change. And when building the server, we really want to have four properties, sort of in order of importance, that will be transparent, stable, fast, and extensible. And by transparent, what I mean is that we can see what's going on inside of it while it's running in production. That means that we need to have a lot of metrics. It also means that we need to have a small number of metrics that we need to pay attention to regularly. And it also needs to have a structure that allows us to map the code onto these metrics, right? If something is going wrong, we need to be able to look at the code and understand, uh, or at least build a hypothesis of what's going on quite quickly. We want it to be stable, right? If we deploy it and everything seems to be okay, that should remain true, even if we look away for a bit. We want it to be robust to pathological requests, right? We want it to reject malformed requests. We want it to reject uh, sort of malicious uh, requests, like a slow loris attack where someone sends us one byte every minute. Uh, we want it to also be robust to lots of well-formed traffic, right? We want it to uh, be able to shed load if the back end is unable to deal with the sheer volume of requests and still stay up itself. We want it to be fast, right? We want it to add as little overhead as possible. And we want it to be predictably so. Uh, if something is fast 99% of the time, but slow the other 1%, that is far worse than being slightly slower uh, on average. And where possible, we want it to be able to detect issues on the back end and route around it, right? We want it to actually make the system faster as a whole than it would be on its own. Lastly, we want it to be extensible. This is a project which, again, is very advantageously positioned. It allows us to do things we couldn't do otherwise in other parts of the system. And so it should be a commons. It should be something that other people in the company feel that they have sort of the right and ability to change to sort of fix their problems. And that means it needs to be small. It needs to be easy to understand. It also means, though, that we need to make sure that it is inflexible, right? It is rigid with respect to the other properties, which outweigh this, right? We don't want it to be easy for them to make it unstable or slow or opaque. But for everything else, we want it to be relatively flexible, right? It should be something that sort of indicates how it's meant to be changed. And when we're thinking about all these properties, uh, the sort of key thing that we should keep in mind is that Designing systems, we don't just look at what sort of the day-to-day -day traffic levels are and say, we need something that can handle this, right? We need to actually think very carefully about what is the utmost craziest situation that we want to be able to handle, 
right? And in that crazy situation, what do we expect it to do? And what do we expect it to do if we go just over the edge, right? Does it fall over? Are we dead? Are we going and just rejecting all the traffic? Like, what are these scenarios? And these are the questions that shape the code, not the, you know, we have X number of requests a second on average every day. And so one of the first decisions that we made, uh, which is shaped again by this sort of question of extremes, is uh, to make it an async server, right? This is sort of a bit of a religious issue in the Java ecosystem because you can do both. You can have a thread per request. You can have, uh, you know, this sort of more complex async model, which has sort of less cost associated with each in-flight request that it's handling. And we chose this here not because it's the one true approach. We chose it because we don't control the application boundaries, either now or in the future, right? We are providing a service to the other parts of the company, and it's not our job to dictate to them what they can and can't do, right? How many requests in flight they actually get to have. And, you know, the deck was a little bit stacked here because when I joined, they'd already written a prototype using Netty, and they hired me, in fact, because I have years of experience using Netty. And so it's, again, not necessarily the most uh, objective set of decisions that we made here, but it is, I think, a reasonable one, right? Most high-performance networking uh, sort of projects, processes, uh, sort of frameworks are all built on top of Netty uh, within the sort of JVM ecosystem. And so this helps us in some ways, right? It makes us fast because Netty is a high-performance uh, networking layer. Uh, and it makes us stable because we're able to handle greater extremes of traffic. Unfortunately, it makes us quite a bit less easy to understand, right? Stack traces are the foundation of the JVM sort of ecosystem in terms of understanding what's going on. You have the ability to do stack dumps using JSTAC. You have a whole host of profiling tools. And all these things sort of assume that your threads mean something, right? That they are a meaningful narrative about what's going on inside your code. And the whole async callback mechanism kind of just stomps that into nothing. And so that's a problem, right? Uh, maybe a little bit less concerning is the fact that the callback sort of model is harder to reason about, right? Someone coming in from some other team who hasn't internalized this sort of approach will find this a little bit uh, difficult to reason about. And so the sort of first thing that we need to think about is how do we get back uh, the sort of ease of understanding, right? The, the give back something that's sort of like a stack trace. And the approach that we used was to create a finite state machine. And I want to be clear because we use this uh, sort of term to describe two different things, one of which is the formal automata theory mechanism that underlies regular expressions. And then there's another sort of much more informal thing where we draw a bunch of boxes and lines and use that as sort of a uh, broad spec. And we're talking about the latter. And so uh, this is a complete finite state machine, right? We start a request, and then we either succeed or we fail. This is complete. This covers all possible you know, outcomes. But again, what we want to do is capture sort of the nuances, right? If something fails, we want to know why it fails. If something succeeded, we want to know how it succeeded. And so we can expand this out a little bit, right? Uh, in the course of handling requests, we first call out to an auth service, which tells us whether or not the request is allowed to uh, be let into the rest of our system. If that succeeds, then we make a call to the back end service. And if that succeeds, then we succeed. And so uh, in each of these cases, these can fail, though, right? We may not actually get a request. We may not get a successful outcome from our call to the auth service. We may not get a successful outcome from the back end service, right? So now we have more failures and more sort of uh, intermediate nodes on our way to success. But then failure is sort of a uh, broad term, right? Uh, maybe we actually want to know why we failed, how we failed. So we can actually start talking about like timeouts, right? Either uh, the service we're calling didn't actually respond or something else happened. We don't know what, but you know, something. That's sort of the catch-all case. And so you can keep on expanding this out, uh, you know, and sort of further refining it and being further sort of granular in terms of all the possible uh, contingencies, and that's what we did. And, uh, you know, you can't quite read this, I think, uh, from here, but uh, you can see here that along the left there is this sort of box of the happy path, right? All the things that we do on our way towards success. And hanging off to the right are a bunch of red boxes which represent all the ways that we can go wrong. And I'm just going to kind of step through this very quickly because I think, you know, it's worth sort of understanding exactly how granular we were. So at first we have just a connection waiting, right, for a request to come in, and then the request comes in or it doesn't because we time out or because the connection closes before we receive one. And once we have a connection, we try to figure out which machine within the auth service should we call. We get a root, 
Uh, if we're able to get a root, then we try to get a connection to that particular machine through our connection pool. If we get that connection, then we go and actually send the request. Once we've sent the request, we wait for the response. Once we get the response, we check to see whether or not it was uh, authorized. If it was, and we continue on to make a call to our backend service. Uh, and we go through the same sort of song and dance again, right? We get a root to a particular machine. We get a connection to that machine. Uh, and then we send the request. But here, things get a little bit tricky because we've sent the request, which is just the first part, right? It's the thing that has the URI, has the headers. We haven't sent the body yet. And so now we have this sort of issue where we need to first send the body up to the backend server, right? It needs to actually get the full request. But it has enough information to start sending us a response. And in fact, some APIs are structured such that it will take pieces, chunks of the request, and start sending back chunks of the response in line. And so if we don't allow these two things to happen concurrently, we can deadlock, right? We're trying to send more of the body back to uh, up to the backend server, and it's trying to send more of the response back to us. If we were to order these, right, upload the entire body before we start to handle the response, things could go very badly. And we, again, don't know what the application might want to do. This is not something that we do anywhere within Fitbit, but we have to allow it, or years later, someone's going to be very confused. So over here, we have the uh, sort of sidelined upload of the body. And then back here, we're waiting back for the response. Once we get the response, we forward it back to the client. We then forward the response body. And finally, we're done, right? So easy. And so again, this is a very informal thing. This has no uh, ability to go and generate code. This is no real mapping into our code base. And so we have to sort of invent one. And the way that we did this is using what we call a passport. And a passport basically allows us to mark each time we advance within our state machine, right? We stamp it each time with uh, the state and the timestamp. And that's literally what we do. Within the code, we have a thing that says we're marking that we are sending the backend request body. And then still later, within a callback, we say we have sent the backend request body. And so this is not something which is sort of a provable implementation of this, right? Again, this is very informal, but we have now this sort of one-to-one -one mapping, right? Something that we can go and sort of trace through the diagram that we generated and sort of map it to what's going on inside the code. And there are a few other sort of abstractions that we need to uh, look at to sort of understand all the pieces that they fit together. We have a thing called a router, which routes. Given a request, it tells us uh, which machine we should actually send that request to. You'll notice here that there's also a parameter called an event loop. This is sort of a Netty thing, where Netty uh, does parallelism by creating n many single-threaded event loops. And we want to make sure that our request for all the various sort of network traffic it does stays on that event loop. And so we have to provide this as an additional piece of information. We also have a thing called a channel pool. We call it a channel pool because Netty calls connections channels. You see here that we have an acquire call. The acquire call is given a service route and returns a future that will yield an HTTP socket. We also have a release, which gives a socket back to the pool for reuse. An HTTP socket is basically what you would expect. It is kind of like a TCP connection, except that it speaks at a higher level uh, sort of protocol. We can get the next message off of a connection. Uh, the message is sort of the first part of that request, everything but the body. We can forward the content from one socket to another. That is actually forwarding the body. And we can write an arbitrary message into the socket. And I want to call out specifically here that we have explicit mandatory parameters here that give bounds to each of these methods. It says how long they're willing to take. And in the case of the forward content, how much uh, actual bandwidth we're willing to use. Right? These are not optional. There's no way to opt out of this. You have to define the boundaries of your system. Because again, that is what defines the behavior of everything. And so we have this sort of life cycle right, that uses these sockets. Right? We have a connection that represents our incoming or client connection. We have the off connection. We have the back end connection. We have this thing that sort of threads them all together. And we call it a request state machine. And a request state machine takes this router and the channel pool and the passport. And then when we call init, we hand it the initial client connection. It just kind of goes from there. right? We are no longer interacting with it. It's just sort of driving itself forward. And when it's finally done, it tells request passport that it is done. And the request passport is then responsible for uh, sort of generating all the metrics. Right? This is sort of a critical separation here, because I think that in a lot of code, which has sort of a rich set of metrics, which you want, 
uh, you end up interleaving that with all your business logic. And oftentimes, the metrics code is much more verbose than your business logic, because you're trying to track a bunch of different things that are in flight. And I think that this has sort of problems for a lot of reasons. We want to be able to uh, look at the business code and not have to think about all of the sort of side channel communications that we're doing. It's also very hard to verify that we're doing it right. If we have some sort of interval, uh, as we do, where we track, for instance, the amount of time that elapsed between us trying to acquire a connection uh, to the back end service and the, between the time we actually acquire it, but we also want how much time it elapsed between trying to acquire it and actually completing the request. These are both useful for different reasons. Uh, if we were to get this wrong, if we were to measure the wrong interval, how would we know? What is our baseline, right? It's easy to get this wrong and never realize it. And so having this sort of separation, having something which has a data representation of this state was advanced to at this time and being able to sort of reason about the intervals of that, just that pure data thing, not this sort of imperative generate this metric right here in line with our business logic. It's a really helpful thing, both in terms of simplicity of the code and the correctness of our metrics. So the point of this talk is to kind of try to give a slightly uncomfortably close look at some of the aspects of this, right? Not because necessarily we think that what we've done is amazing and, you know, transcendent and, you know, you all should take a look at this, but because I think that we don't talk about these things enough, right? We don't actually have uh, sort of practical hands-on uh, examples of, you know, code that actually runs in production. And so I'm going to show you a bit of this code, again, with a caveat that, uh, I don't think that this is anything special, and I think that there are things which are trade-offs that I wouldn't defend to you know, the death, but here it is. This is a function called send backend request. This is what happens once we've actually received the authentication. We want to forward that request, and so it'll go and it'll acquire a connection to the backend, and it will write it. So first, at the top here, we check to see that the client is actually connected. If it isn't, we go and we just clean everything up and give up, because what's the point? Uh, if we are still connected, though, we go and we uh, mark that we're going to uh, get the route, and we get the route. If there is no route, then we really can't do much, and so we return that we can't proceed and uh, bail out, but otherwise we tell the passport what the route is that we selected. We then check to see whether or not the request to the client was keep alive, so we know whether or not to close the connection uh, once we actually have completed all of this. And once we've done that, we go and we overwrite parts of the request because there are things that are specific to our connection to the client that we don't want to transitively sort of carry over to our backend connection. We don't want upgrade headers and other sorts of things to carry through there, and we don't want it to uh, ever be anything but a keep alive connection, right? We want to reuse our connections. That's how we get uh, sort of better performance. Then we define a callback, uh, which will take a future representing the sort of connection that we're going to get to this server. If it succeeds, then we go and we mark that we've acquired the connection. We then start to write uh, to that. We send the request, and we register another callback, which marks the success of sending that request. If we are successful, then we mark again on the password that we have, and then we uh, fire off these two different parts of our state machine. Recall that we are now both sending the body up to the backend service and receiving the response from the backend service. And so we do each of those in turn. If we failed to write, then we have to return an error and uh, sort of bail out. And then finally, if we failed to get a connection at all, we have to handle that and all the sort of different ways that we could fail to get that. Having to find that callback, we now mark that we're about to get the connection. And then we acquire it and add our callback. And, you know, the request state machine is a number of those sorts of functions, about 300 lines of stuff that looks roughly like this. And, you know, this code is not, I think, the prettiest that you've seen, right? Uh, there is a thing, uh, well publicized, I think, within the Node community called callback hell. And it roughly goes like this. We have a callback, and we have to handle the error case and the success case. But if we do succeed, then we have to handle some other nested thing, which you know, has an error case and a success case. And inside that success outcome, we have another callback. And you know, this can go arbitrarily deep, right? You can have arbitrarily, an arbitrary number of closing curly and round braces at the end of this big scope. And it's not nice. It's hard to reason about. It's hard to know what kind of context you're in when you're looking at the code. Indentation is not really all that helpful here. And so there exist a dozen or more libraries that try to make this better, right? You have these sorts of promise combinators, which provide some sort of method like then, which allows you to denest them, allows you to linearize all these callbacks. 
And uh, it makes it cleaner, right, by having just a single success callback. And it treats the errors as sort of this implicit thing, where if anything errors out, it will just short circuit and pass that through to the bottom. And this makes it simpler, undeniably, but what it also does is it sort of conflates, it munges together all the possible errors. It says either we succeed or we failed for some reason, right? And that runs entirely counter to our uh, desire to understand specifically why something failed. And so if we were to try to reproduce this, we would have something that more looks like this, right? Because there is an inherent complexity here, inherent branchiness that we have to capture. We can't just sort of elide that. We can't just sort of, you know, cover over it because it makes our code more complex. Uh, and this is not to say that we couldn't create something that still looks like this, something that sort of makes us a little bit cleaner, makes us a little bit less sort of, you know, callback hellish. And I stand before you as someone who's actually written a number of abstractions over sort of async things uh, within the Clojure ecosystem. And so by all rights, I should be the one uh, sort of, you know, triumphantly showing you these abstractions that I've made here that make the code very beautiful. But again, this is about 300 lines of callback code. And the abstractions, if they're going to make that cleaner, they have to make it really clean and they have to be really, really simple to understand because it's just not that much code, right? You know, we don't want to build a tower of abstraction to just, you know, make this tiny little surface area of our code uh, a little bit easier to understand. That's a poor use of my time as an engineer. It's a poor use of anyone's time who's trying to understand the code because they see this code and they're like, okay, I kind of get what's going on, but how does this look under the covers? And all of a sudden, there's this enormous new set of kind of uh, terms and concepts and implementations that they have to understand. And it, so we decided to sort of leave it as is, right? The request state machine is, you know, about 300 lines of callbacky stuff and some other supporting code. Um, it's messy, but pragmatically so, right? We, we, you know, kind of decided that that was a worthwhile trade-off to make. And it's informally specified by uh, a graphviz file, a dot file, which we use to generate an image, which, uh, you know, we try to keep sort of more or less in sync with each other. And so thus far, I've kind of talked to you about how uh, a single request threads through our system, right? But that's really uh, not the entire story because we have tons of these requests flowing through us at all, the time, all the time and we have to understand how these things uh, work together, right? How they sort of shape uh, the system in tandem. And there is a thing called queuing theory. It's a branch of statistics. Uh, it is largely concerned with uh, sort of proving formal properties about systems that do not resemble the systems that we build. Um, but there are some insights that can be sort of gleaned from this, and rather than talk about queuing theory, I want to uh, tell you about a pumpkin carver at a state fair. And uh, in deference to my lack of any sort of artistic ability, um, we're going to be pretty abstract here. <laughs> so the pumpkin carvers are the X, pumpkins are the O's, lines are the Q's, and here we have a pumpkin carver uh, doing their work. Uh, someone is standing there with a pumpkin in line, they go and, uh, you know, start handling uh, one of those pumpkins, they finish that pumpkin, and then handle the next, right? Easy, very reasonable to sort of uh, think about. A problem arises, though, when someone realizes that there is no upper boundary on how big the pumpkins can be. And so someone goes and drives up in their caged forklift and patiently waits in line for their turn. So. So then, you know, uh, the pumpkin carver goes and starts to carve it out and scoop out all the innards and, you know, slowly starts to make forward progress. And while this is happening, people keep showing up. And the problem here is not just the people who are waiting behind while the pumpkin is being carved. The problem is that once the pumpkin is gone, there's still this enormous line, right? There's still this after effect. And this after effect can last for quite some time and how long it lasts uh, depends on how much sort of excess capacity is, right? How much utilization we were having. Because we have to pay down this debt now, right? So if our pumpkin carver was quite busy, if they were busy 90% of the time, however long that giant pumpkin took to carve, that line, the sort of, you know, uh, excess latency that has been sort of put into this queue will last 10 times longer. Which, you know, will probably be the rest of the day, right? People will show up and they won't know why the line is so long. They won't know that there was a giant pumpkin here, but they will know that it's taking an awful long time to get their pumpkin carved. And you'll see this in traffic jams, right? Even when the accident is sort of cleared out, it still takes a while for the you know, traffic to normalize. And so one way that we can mitigate this is we can have many pumpkin carvers uh, handling the same queue, 
in this case, when a giant pumpkin shows up, one of these carvers is going to have a really you know, big job to do, but the other one is able to still keep things going, right? They're still able to make forward progress. The line is not just going to kind of grow unbounded behind that single carver. And I want to contrast this with a different approach where we have sort of multiple queues, right? And in this case, uh, everyone has sort of like a one in n chance of, you know, getting behind the giant pumpkin and pour them, but the other people won't. But this still means that some people are going to have a really bad time, right? It, it uh, makes the sort of average case better, but it still isn't quite as optimal, right? You will find that in every case, having many, many people servicing one queue will give you the best behavior under adverse conditions. Unfortunately, that's not always possible, right? We can't necessarily fit an unbounded number of pumpkin carvers around this single line. And so, you know, in our county fair, we try to get as much space as possible, and they tell us that we actually only have two spaces available, uh, one at uh, each end of the, the uh, state fairgrounds. So uh, we set up different carvers there, and we set up a line somewhere towards the entrance to try to make sure that we're getting an even distribution across there. And so in this particular case, we can assume that, you know, we, we have taken to heart the fact that we want to have many consumers for a single queue. And so all of our carvers are busy. If one of them actually finishes, they radio in that they are ready for a new pumpkin. And we then begin the long trek across the fairgrounds to actually get our pumpkin carved. And this is a problem, right? Uh, because we have a situation where we have a pumpkin carver who's not doing any work, and we have a person who wants their pumpkin carved, and yet nothing's happening, right? There's something that is sort of preventing us from doing this. And this is lost throughput. This is lost efficiency, right? We are not making good uh, use of our resources here. And so uh, this is maybe optimal for the, uh, the customers, for the people with the pumpkins, but it's not optimal for us. It's not optimal in terms of you know, our sort of you know, money-making endeavors. And so we might sort of compromise a little bit, right? We might set up a couple of queues so that we always have at least you know, one pumpkin on deck when we want to you know, do some more work, right? And so now the guy with the radio at the entrance is in the job of just sending a small, bounded number of pumpkins to each of these pieces at the end of the state fair. So if someone comes in, they'll be sent to one and then sent to one of the pumpkin carvers. And so I just want to contrast this with a different scenario where we have a pumpkin carving factory. And in this particular case, all we're concerned about is throughput. All we're concerned about is the overall efficiency in terms of how we're using our resources, right? Our workers. And in that case, we love queues, right? We love a big old, like, uh, sort of, you know, collection of pumpkins that we can work on. And if we get too many, right? If, you know, 10 giant pumpkins show up in a night, we can go and we can, you know, call people in. We can spin up new workers, right? All we are concerned about here is are we making good use of our pumpkin carving resources? But the state fair, or you know, carnival sort of situation here, uh, is more nuanced, right? We're trying to balance these things because there are real people waiting for us to do the work, right? They're going to get bored. They're going to get pissed. They're going to leave bad reviews on Yelp. And so we need to balance their need to get their pumpkins carved quickly, where if we were just trying to optimize that, we would just have a 1,000 pumpkin carvers sitting around all the time on the off chance that 1,000 people show up at once with our needs to make efficient use of our resources, where we are trying to make sure that you know, no one's just kind of sitting around twiddling their thumbs. And so it's harder, and it's much more contextual, right? There is no one right answer here. And so just to kind of you know, break down this metaphor a little bit, um, the different sort of uh, collections of these pumpkin carvers are our backends, right? These are hardware cores, and they're uh, servicing sort of a queue, which is generated by a web server uh, you know, handling all the incoming requests. The uh, entry queue and the guy with the radio who is directing them, that's us. That's the front-end server. And this thing that is deciding where we actually want to send our, uh, each pumpkin, right, each request, is our load balancing algorithm. And you might wonder, uh, what is you know, the giant pumpkin a metaphor for, right? And, and you might think, oh, it's just a really expensive request, right? Someone just uploads a gigabyte of data or something like that. But in practice, uh, it's not that simple because we, from our position, right, where we are sort of, you know, sending these pumpkins into, thing, into these places, we don't know the difference between a pumpkin which is really difficult to carve and a carver who's having a really difficult time, right? There's no difference from a pumpkin which is really, really hard to carve and someone who is just like, you know, talking on their phone the entire time or someone who's taking a coffee break, right? We don't have uh, a position to really differentiate between those two. And so when we have these load balancing uh, algorithms, we need to distribute the work fairly, 
And our goal is to send work where it can be done the most quickly, right? We are only in the business of minimizing latency. All the decisions that optimize for throughput, those have been made elsewhere. Those are sort of uh, properties of the infrastructure that we've already built. And the load balancing algorithm is only concerned with where do we send the work to get done quickly. And sometimes the, work, the nodes we send this work to will be slow, and we won't know why, right? We, the engineers, might be able to look into that. But we, the algorithm that is going and making this decision, does not have that sort of perspective. And so we just have to kind of deal with this as it comes. And so when we talk about load balancing algorithms, one of the uh, most common ones that we're you know, all sort of familiar with is round robin. And round robin is very simple. We have a counter for each request that comes in. We increment it. We then take the modulus of that and the number of servers that we have. And if it's zero, we send it to the zeroth node. If it's one, we send it to the first node, and so on. The problem here is that round robin is in the business of evenly distributing request volume. And so if one of our nodes is slow, we don't really care, right? We just keep on sending it the same number of requests that everyone is getting, and we get this backup, right? And again, even once that node recovers, there's now this backlog which is going to far outlast that sort of duration of you know, whatever issue is going through. And so round robin is very simple. It uses a single piece of state. It has predictable request volume. We can verify that it's sort of doing what it should. But it amplifies issues within the system. Whenever there's a slowdown, it makes it worse. So an alternate approach we can use is sort of the least connection strategy, um, or least in-flight requests, right? which tracks how many requests each node is currently handling and sends uh, the next request to whichever one is handling the least. So in this particular case, if we uh, you know, have uh, two on each of these nodes and one on the last, then we send the next request to that one. If all of them are handling an equal number of requests, then we randomly select one of them. And so the nice property here is that if one of our nodes slows down, uh, then it just stops making forward progress. And so while the other nodes around it are handling you know, requests, are, are opening up capacity, we will go and we will just sort of route around naturally, right? We'll send uh, work to where work is actually happening. And so the two or more requests which are sort of waiting on this node, which is having a bad day, uh, they're sort of a lost cause, right? We sent them already, right? We don't get to unring that bell. But at the very least, we're minimizing the number of requests which are going to sort of suffer as a result of that. And so least in flight is a significantly better approach uh, at the cost of some additional sort of complexity, right? We have a little bit more state now. Um, and it's also a little bit harder to verify that it's doing its job because we're no longer looking at the request per second. We have to look at what is the concurrent load on each of these machines? How many requests do each of them have? But it does you know, minimize the impact of slowdowns. But there's a problem here, actually, which is that if one of our machines is uh, in a bad state where it's not slow, but in fact very quick to error out, right? just very quickly returns a 503, I'm too busy, then this heuristic, as, as described, would go and just start funneling all the traffic there, which amplifies, again, this sort of problem. We don't want to do that. And so we want to, uh, or have to, really, uh, make this a slightly more, or maybe even significantly more, complicated. We have, uh, we have to track both the in-flight requests. You also have to track the historical failure rate of each of the nodes. And to track that, we use an exponentially weighted moving average, uh, which uh, sort of biases our uh, value of sort of success rate uh, to the last one or two minutes. And we have to make sure that no matter what's going on, no matter how bad any particular node is doing, we we'll always have at least one in-flight request because we have to know once it recovers, right? We can't just, you know, uh, ban it for life because it had a bad day. Um, and this means that we have a predictable concurrent load, but only if there weren't recent failures. And so, again, this makes it even harder for us to sort of verify that it's doing what we expect. But at the end of the day, it does what we want it to do. It minimizes the impact of both slowdowns and outages uh, on our back end. So to kind of concretely talk about what uh, you know, the impact of this thing would be, uh, we have uh, an issue with our deploys, which I think many people do, especially in sort of the Java land, where you know, when you restart the server, it's slow, right? The caches are cold, it has to JIT. Um, and the round robin approach, again, uh, is exactly uh, the opposite of what we want, right? Because we keep on throwing more and more traffic at it. And so what we were seeing with the round robin approach, which was being used by uh, HAProxy previously, whenever we would do deploys, uh, our sort of P999 latency, right? Uh, our 99.9th percentile, uh, was nine seconds. We'd get these big old spikes. And we would see that about 1,000 requests over the course of the deploy would actually time out, would be greater than 10 seconds. When we moved to least in flight, it went down to about 1.5 seconds. And we had, you know, give or take, no timeouts. 
And so this is a significant change, right? This is a meaningful impact on our customers. And of course, this is exaggerated by the fact that we're looking at the top end of this distribution. If we're looking at the median values, uh, this would not be nearly as important. But this sort of brings me to uh, a point about metrics in general, which is uh, you improve what you measure, right? Uh, this is sort of a truism. I probably have heard this before. But like, if, we're, if we say that we're looking at the median latency, that's basically saying that you know, the 49% of our customers can, you know, just, you know, do whatever they want. They suck. We, we don't care about them, right? Uh, as long as we are going and giving the majority of our customers a good experience, like, we just don't really care. And obviously, that's not true, right? But I actually much prefer the uh, converse version of this, because I think that this sort of captures it a little bit more accurately, which is everything that you ignore will get worse, right? And this is important because it's not enough just to measure something, right? We can have thousands of metrics, and that doesn't mean that thousands of things are consistently getting better in our system. What consistently gets better, or at least what consistently does not get worse, is the metrics that we actually look at regularly, the metrics that we examine every time we do a deploy, the metrics that we look at every day just in case, right? Otherwise, these things will slowly, inevitably get worse. And so, when we were building uh, our you know, front end server, we had to sort of decide what are our key metrics, right? Um, and it can't be latency, because latency is not really a factor of what we're doing. It's a factor of whatever back end service we're calling into. And so the one that we uh, decided on was overhead. Overhead, um, and I, when I showed this initial uh, state machine, you might have noticed that some of the edges were blue. I bolded them here to make it a little bit more obvious. The blue transitions here are where we are waiting for someone else to do something, right? We have sent a request out into the ether. We are waiting for a response. And these are not intervals that we have any real control over. Conversely, everything else we do, right? If there's a connection pool sort of backup because too many people are trying to get a connection to a particular backend, that's time that we are adding, right? That is overhead that we are uh, contributing to the request. If we are taking too long to compute something, that is overhead. If we have GC pauses, that's overhead, right? And so we want to keep a very close eye on this, because this is a proxy for a wide variety of things that we can do wrong. And so our key metrics are our P999 overhead, which is about uh, 0.4 milliseconds right now. And unfortunately, that's not enough by itself, because we could have a very low overhead because we have very few requests. right? So we have to look at that. We have to make sure that we're actually getting a reasonable volume of traffic. And we could also get a low overhead because we are just erroring out very quickly. So we have to look at our error rate. But these three things together, these are what we alert on, right? These are what we are paying attention to. These are what we've thought very carefully about what the thresholds should be. We are not just adding random thresholds to dozens or hundreds of metrics. It's just these three. Now, we have many, many other metrics that we uh, you know, keep track of, but these exist so that if one of these key metrics looks weird, we can understand why, right? Having high overhead does not describe what's going on in the system. It just indicates that there's something that we should be paying attention to. And so that's really it. Uh, you know, the things that I want to you know, have you take away from this is that if you're building a system like this, articulate what your goals are and put them in order of importance. Right? As I said you know, before, we had all these things that we wanted. And extensibility, right? the ability of uh, some random person to come up and start contributing is something that we really want to allow for. But it cannot trump all the other things we care about, right? It cannot trump the stability of the system. We don't want uh, someone to be able to kind of come in and do that. And so we have to think about these things and make our trade-offs and judge our trade-offs on the basis of our goals. And when we're building a system like this, we have to understand and describe what the extremities are. What are the things that uh, we are willing to do? And what is our expected behavior when we sort of go over the edge? And choose your metrics carefully, because once you put something in production, this is what guides the evolution of your system. Right? This is what informs what you change, what you tweak, what you try to improve, and above all, what you allow to get worse. And so uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. So I believe we have some time for questions. Yes. Uh, so the patchwork that you were describing mm -hmm. with the state machine, um, you sort of described it as being useful for like a bookkeeping purpose to keep track of sort of where through that sort of overall request process you are for any given connection. Um, have you thought about using that also 
Uh, yes, so the question was, uh, are we using the passport as a way to sort of model the correctness of the system? Um, unfortunately, I had to cut out quite a bit of this talk uh, yesterday because I realized it was going to go way over time. So one of the things I, I didn't really talk about was um, how we use this to test, right? Because the state machine is basically a mechanism for defining coverage, right, in a, in a more meaningful way than just like how many code branches are we dealing with. And so uh, what we do is we basically set up a test harness where we um, have all the back ends and have some proxies that simulate network failures and sort of tweak them and make sure that we are following the path that we expect. Um, we also, in every log, uh, expose that, uh, log that sort of, you know, passport and what the uh, intervals were between each state. And so that gives us a very sort of clear understanding of, you know, what's fast, what's slow, you know, uh, what exactly, you know, how did we get where we got? Yes? So the question was, why do we uh, roll our own rather than use something like HA proxy? So um, this is something that I, I think I meant to sort of discuss. When we were talking about the goals, right? We, we route, we uh, validate, and we shape the traffic. So HA proxy and Nginx and other things like that are great at routing, right? Uh, they're less good at sort of capturing the specifics of what it is that we need, what validation means for Fitbit, what shaping means for Fitbit. And there is some extensibility there that uh, you know, exists, you can do Lua scripting and Nginx and stuff like that. But like at the end of the day, you really want, it's not a big piece of code and it makes sense to have it be very, very uh, flexible and very sort of custom fit to what you need because it is again in such this sort of powerful position within the system. And if you look at, uh, you know, Google, Google ha has the Google web server, uh, Twitter has a Twitter front end, uh, Netflix has Zool, each of them has sort of rolled their own. And in, except in the case of Netflix, none of them have open sourced it because it's not a useful thing to open source, right? It's, it's a solution to their problem and will be developed to fit their needs and isn't sort of an attempt at a general form of, you know, the problem because that's quite complex. Whereas the sort of very narrow needs of a particular company are more tractable. Yes? Uh, we, we do. So those are where our alert thresholds are. Um, there are other sorts of metrics, you know, that are for the surrounding systems. And, uh, but, you know, those sorts of capture all of these sort of bad things, right? If there's an error, then that will capture all the sorts of things that you would normally sort of bundle under, like, how high are our 500 sort of, you know, or 5xx responses. And, you know, latency and other things are there. So uh, we kind of have looked at it, and it does seem to capture all the things that we care about. We have run books which say, if you see this, then here are the other sort of ancillary metrics that you should look at to kind of determine what's going on here. We don't have it quite as like a flow chart, but that's sort of the uh, eventual place we would like to be there, right? It's a very sort of, you know, checklist sort of, you know, here's what could be going wrong sort of deal. Yes? Uh, okay, so the question was, is there any reason that we would want to use a Netty directly rather than a higher level wrapper? Um, he used a, he mentioned my wrapper for Netty, which is written in Clojure. And so we don't use Clojure at uh, Fitbit. And so that is uh, the main reason that you wouldn't use that. Uh, there are other Java land uh, sort of extensions on top of that. Uh, the short answer is, uh, it's just not a big piece of code, right? If you're trying to write tons of async logic, it might make sense to kind of, you might get more leverage out of these sort of higher order abstractions that are there, but the parts that interact directly with Netty are not that many. And so at the end of the day, having an additional layer of indirection that makes it harder to reason about what's going on under the covers doesn't give you much. Like it it uh, costs a lot more than it, you know, sort of benefits you. Yes? Uh, we, uh, the question was, what do we use for service discovery? We use the, uh, the Zookeeper server set mechanism, um, which, you know, uh, is part of the Twitter sort of, you know, ecosystem of things. Yes? So the worst failure that we've observed, um, I believe, was, and so this is, again, something that I would have loved to have talked about. We're, we're going slightly over time here. If people want to start going to lunch, by the way, it's, it's outside. Please, I won't be offended. But... Uh, um, so, uh, the worst failure was when we actually were having uh, out of memory exceptions. So, Netty uses um, off heap memory um, to make it uh, more efficient to sort of talk to the networking stack. And it uses slab allocation, which has reference counting, which, you know, can go wrong for all the obvious reasons. And so, we were uh, trying to track 
uh, that pretty well, but we had, we had this one sort of case that we were seeing in production that we hadn't tested for. And um, the problem was that we were using uh, the sort of out-of-the-box metrics using the, uh, the Code of Halo metrics library, which was uh, getting from JMX, and there was a metric it provided there that was called off-heat memory. Right? So we're like, cool, we're tracking this. Turns out that that doesn't actually do what you would think it would do, which is tell you how much off-heat memory there is. And um, so uh, that uh, value actually happens to be like a private field under Java NIO bits. And you have to use reflection to kind of make it accessible and then you know, track that. So uh, the worst failure that we had was that um, after a, a fit, fixed amount of time, the machine started all toppling over without a memory exceptions. And um, luckily, we have some redundancy. And um, one of these machines is able to handle roughly about 50,000 requests per second. And so uh, we caught it before enough of them fell over that it actually impacted production. But it was a very, very new thing. And then we spent uh, a number of very confusing days trying to figure out what was going on and like examining the uh, memory dumps to kind of understand what's going on. And you know, a, another part of this that I wanted to kind of talk about is that you should really validate your metrics, right? Like if you have this sort of thing that's telling you something and there's some way for you to get external validation that it's telling you the right thing, like do that. It's going to you know, uh, be worthwhile, I think. Yes? The question was, does the server do uh, circuit breaking or bulkheading? Uh, we rely on the service discovery to do that for us. If a server goes and takes it out of the service, uh, the service set, then we basically stop sending it traffic. And we rely on uh, it or some sort of other external mechanism to tell us that that server's off limits. Uh, all right, I don't think that there's anyone. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>